This evening we turn our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34. Keep your Bible open at Ezekiel 34. I'm not going to read the whole chapter for us now, but I'm going to lead us in into the context from chapter 33. So let me make, do the introduction to the sermon and then lead us into the passage and keep referring back to it because it's a long, a long chapter and uh, I need to get through the whole chapter this evening. So as we approach the prophet Ezekiel this evening, um, Ezekiel is known as one as, uh, of the great literary prophets of the Old Testament, along with Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel. These are the f- four major literary prophets. Their ministry was one of writing the things that God had shown and revealed and spoken to them. Um, there are other prophets of the Lord who did not write the things that were told to them. Examples are Elijah and Elisha. They uh, were prophets as mouthpieces of God who did not have a writing ministry. But one thing that all the prophets of God have in common is that they have the same calling. They were all called to be a mouthpiece for God, a mouthpiece of God to his people. They were called to declare to God's people, thus says the Lord. So the prophets didn't speak by their own authority. They brought a message from God. And so they said, thus saith the Lord. This was their calling. When the prophet of God delivers his divine message, the people of God then also know that it is God himself speaking through his prophet. God had shown his people how to identify false prophets and how to identify true prophets. And God expects his people to listen to the true prophets as if God himself speaks through these prophets. So God holds the people accountable to listen to the true prophets message. God himself is speaking. We must not think that God somehow, through speaking through the prophets, somehow bypasses the consciousness of the prophets so that they clutch out, so that they are out of their minds when God speaks through them. And then when they've done speaking, they say, what did I say? What did I do? It's not as if the Spirit of God so takes hold of them that they are not aware of what they are doing. Each prophet of the Lord was conscious of the fact that he was speaking for God. Each prophet was conscious that he had to carefully speak the words that God had laid on his mouth. This was a tremendous responsibility for each of the prophets. And the penalty for twisting the message or the penalty for taking God's word and ignoring it was death. Was death. The tension that each prophet would then have to wrestle with with was this burden placed upon them by their call to speak the word of God. And to speak this word of God to a people who generally did not want to hear the word of God. So it's either the prophets say what God wants them to say or die by the hand of God. Or they change the message and say what the people want to hear and die by the hand of God. But then they would be accepted by God's people. So the people who don't want to hear God's word would be very happy if a prophet were to change the message. So the prophet is very conscious that either he's going to suffer the wrath of God if he does not speak the word, or he's going to suffer the wrath of the people when he does speak the word of God to them who do not want to hear. And so every prophet must choose whose side he is on when he speaks. And the true prophets then speak as God commissioned them. Today, the preacher faces much the same challenge. Is the preacher going to be faithful to the word of God? Is he going to preach what is in God's word? Or is he going to tickle the ears of his audience? Is he going to say things that the audience, that the people in church want to hear? Or is he going to be faithful? And here's a question for you all. Which one would you prefer? Would you prefer a preacher to tickle your ears? Or would you prefer a preacher who is faithful to the word of God and who makes it his priority to pray and be conscious in speaking the word of God to God's people, weighing carefully his words 
taking pains to prepare his sermons and his messages and to bring it in a way that is faithful to God's word. A preacher that tells you that what God's word says or what God, God's word tells us um, is something that is very scarce in our day. We don't find many pastors who are faithful to God's word. We rather have men who twist the message or transform the message into something that the hearers would listen to. So do you want one who speaks the word of God to you or do you want one that speaks what you want to hear? Today, as in the days of the prophet, there is a general apathy. So people speak what, uh, what the audience wants to hear. Preachers speak what the audience wants to hear because the audience is apathetic to God's word. Just like in the old days when Israel was apathetic, couldn't care less what God has to say and pr prefer not that God speak to them. So in today's world, people prefer that God does not say anything. But in the midst of a general apathy, in the midst of a growing number of people who does not want anything to do with the word of God, there are still a handful of God's own people who live by every word that proceeds from God's mouth. And it is to them, it is to them that the prophets speak God's word faithfully. It is for their sake, because they understand that man lives by every word that proceeds from God's mouth. And this is the tension we'll see as we open up this chapter in Ezekiel 34. Because in Ezekiel chapter 34, God prophesies against the shepherds of Israel. Because the shepherds of Israel kept themselves busy with the fat, with the fat and the strong sheep, and they didn't tend to the weak and the frail. They didn't tend to the needy. They used and exploited God's flock, flock for themselves. But God's true prophet is always mindful, is always mindful of that small group of people who truly value the word of God as food that is necessary for the soul. They counted, as Isaiah says in Isaiah 52 and verse 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Even Paul uses this saying by Isaiah in Romans 10 and verse 14 to 15. He says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. God's people have a true gratefulness and a true thankfulness for the true prophet of the Lord. They say, how beautiful are the feet of of those who preach good news. And so God's people need to be mindful, just as there are many preachers who twist God's word for the sake of the greater audience, know that the pressure is on God's prophet to speak that word to the minority who appreciate God's word. Continue to pray that the Lord may strengthen preachers today in the midst of much enmity against God's word. Now let's turn to our text in Ezekiel 33. There is news from Jerusalem. Just a quick overview. Ezekiel was of the priestly line. You read of that in Ezekiel 1 from verse 1 to 3. Ezekiel was born as a, as a person from the tribe of Levi. So he would have done priestly duties. But he was in exile. At the age of 25 he goes into exile and in the year when he turns 30, when he is supposed to enter his priestly duties, the word of God comes to Ezekiel. And we can almost uh, uh, identify with the circumstances in which Ezekiel uh, received the word of God because of the swamp outside. Um, Ezekiel was in exile in Babylon, and he was in a refugee camp next to a stream, which, is, uh, which was the, the swamp stream flowing down and by the swamp stream he received um, his calling to be a prophet of the Lord and so we can we can imagine the smells when 
the Lord's word came to Ezekiel. Now, Jerusalem was under siege for a couple of years. So even when Ezekiel went into exile, Jerusalem was still being under, under siege from the Babylonians. It took a couple of years before they, um, before they took in the city. Now, in Ezekiel 33, then, we read of Jerusalem falling. Those in exile waited for news from Jerusalem. They wanted to know, is the city still standing? How is it going with the people in Jerusalem? And so, in their question on their mind is, will God let Jerusalem fall? Will God let the Babylonians take over Jerusalem? All of God's people are waiting to see whether or not Jerusalem would fall in the hands of the Babylonians. And finally, news arrive in in, Jer um, in Babylon, as Ezekiel received this, Ezekiel 33 and verse 21, if you glance down there. In the twelfth year of our exile, in the tenth month, on the fifth day of the month, a fugitive from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has been struck down. Now remember the people were all waiting in anticipation for this news. And this is devastating news that they would receive. The city has been struck down. Jerusalem had fallen into the hand of the Babylonian Empire. The news was devastating. It was shocking to all of God's people because many of them expected that Jerusalem would never fall into the hands of the Babylonians. It's God's city after all. It is God's city. It's Jerusalem. It's the holy place. God will never let the Babylonians take hold of Jerusalem. And so when they hear the news, the city has been struck down, many of them must have asked, where is God in all of this? Where is God in all of this? Why did God not protect Jerusalem? Why did God not protect Jerusalem? Why did Jerusalem fall? Why did Jerusalem fall? After the devastating news came, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel so that Ezekiel will now be the mouthpiece of God to interpret for God's people why Jerusalem had fallen. God says in Ezekiel 33 and verse 24, if you would glance there, when God speaks to Ezekiel, he says to him, Son of man, the inhabitants of these waste places in the land of Israel keep saying Abraham was one, only one man. Yet he got possession of the land, but we are many. The land is surely given us to possess. And so here, God's people have put their trust in their heritage. They relied on their birthright. We are children of Abraham. We were born to receive the blessings of God. This is our heritage. They trusted, in other words, in their external privileges as God's people. To trust on the external privileges is to trust in the gifts of God without trusting in God Himself. They were content with having blessings from God without having God in the picture. You see, they are bragging about being children of Abraham. Now, Ezekiel was commissioned to challenge their religious assumptions. God is reasoning with his people through the prophet Ezekiel. Just like he says through Isaiah the prophet when he calls his people, come let us reason together. Let me see if I can talk some sense into you people, he says through his prophet. You who rely on your external privileges. You who rely on the fact that you were born from a Abraham. God calls them. He accuses them that they have eaten the flesh with the blood. They've lifted up their eyes to idols. They have shed blood. That's verse 25. God says you are idolaters. You are murderers. You are lawbreakers. And God challenges them in verse 25. And he says, shall you then possess the land? Look at who you are. Remember, they were looking at who they are. Abraham was one. We are many. We are so great. We are children of Abraham. We must. But God is saying, no, no, no. Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror of my law and see who you are. You commit idolatry. 
You don't worship me as I said. You are murderers. You are lawbreakers. So God then challenges the expectation of these lawbreakers. You see, they think themselves deserving of God's goodness. And God points out, you don't deserve. You don't deserve. Shall you then possess the land? God adds some more charges in verse 26. He says, you rely on the sword. You commit abominations. You commit adultery. And God just adds more and more to his list of accusations against them. Just look at who you are. Take a good, hard look at yourself, Israel, God says to his people. You can also say to a people who ask this, where is God in all of this? Where is God in my day of trouble? What happened? Why would God let something as terrible as this happen to me? We need to reflect, people. If we are going through difficult times, we need to reflect. Do we deserve God's goodness? Are we maybe presuming upon God that He must bless us because we are His people? Do we presume upon His goodness and blessing toward us? Or are we dependent upon Him to receive from His hand? Are we like Job who says, God gives the good. Shall we not receive good from God and also the evil when that day comes? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Or do we only expect to receive blessing and goodness? The church is also challenged by the words of the Apostle Paul in the same way that the words of Ezekiel challenges Israel. Shall you then possess the land? When Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 to 10, he asks the church, he asks the church, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He's not asking this to people outside the church. He's asking this to the church. Do you not know? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He says, do not be deceived. Who should not be deceived? The church should not be deceived. He's calling the church to be alert, to be awake. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. There is no inheritance. There is no inheritance for a people like that. And we all look at ourselves and we see, just as Paul had said, and such were some of you. Such were some of you. But you see, the operative word there is were, past tense. That's what you were. That's what you were. You are now something different. Now the question then is, what will God do with a guilty people? What will God do with his people Israel? God says in emphatic terms in Ezekiel 33 and verse 27, As I live, when the living God says, as I live, it's almost as serious as when a man says, over my dead body. You know, a man is serious when he makes that statement, over my dead body will this or that. Now God says, as surely as I live, as surely as I live, As surely as I live, those who are in the waste places shall fall by the sword. And whoever is in the open field, I will give to the beast to be devoured. And those who are in the strongholds and in the caves shall die by pestilence. You see, when he says those who are in the waste places, he's talking about Jerusalem that has fallen. It's a, pla a waste place. God is calling His beloved Jerusalem a waste place because of the people. And just as in the book of Ezekiel earlier on, Ezekiel saw the glory of the Lord leave the temple in Jerusalem and the chariot with the glory of the Lord coming to them in Babylon. God had already left Jerusalem. His glory had gone to be with His people in Babylon. God's glory is no longer attached 
You see, God is not like every other idol who is contained in the works of the hands of men. God communicates very clearly, I am the living and the true God and I am with my people. I am not so bound up in a place of mortar and stone. You cannot contain me. So that the prophet Ezekiel reminds God's people that God will not dwell with an unholy people. God will not bless the idolater, the adulterer and the murderer. You see, it's not the Babylonians who are destroying Israel. This is the news that God brings to his people. It's not the Babylonians. It's not the Babylonians that, destroy, that is destroying you. It is you yourself that have brought destruction upon yourself. The Babylonians are only the instrument in God's hand for meeting out the right judgment over a people who were supposed to obey and trust God. You see, it's God himself who is against his people. God brings destruction to them because of their sin, because of their covenant breaking. God had warned them in Deuteronomy of the covenant curses that would come upon them through their idolatry and disobedience. They were fully aware, even before they committed the sin, what would be the consequences of that very sin that they committed. So that now when Jerusalem has fallen, no one can be surprised and say, oh, how can it be? How many sinners do you know that are surprised that their lives are a wreck? And they act as if it's a surprising thing. How terrible. God comes grabs you by the shoulders, shakes you awake and says, realize it's as a result of your own sin. You brought this upon yourself. You brought this upon yourself. The lesson in all of this is that there's a warning against presumption. People should not presume upon the Lord, especially when they have rejected Him by not keeping His word. Covenant breakers should not expect covenant blessing from God. Covenant breakers should not expect covenant blessing from God. God makes himself known through all of his acts of judgment on the covenant breakers. Look at verse 29. Then they will know that I am the Lord. God makes himself known through the covenant judgments, through the curses on his own people. God makes himself known. You will know that I am the Lord. Then they will know that I am the Lord. The covenant breakers will know that he is the Lord when he brings on them the very curses that he has promised to bring upon them. They will know that the covenant God is not one to be trifled with. He's not to be played with. He's not to be toyed with. <clears throat> Their abominations have brought the wrath of God upon themselves. The fall of Jerusalem is no accident, no tragic misfortune, no slip up. God himself brought this destruction and desolation. Look at verse 29 again. When I have made. When I have made. God tells them, I have done this. So where is God in all of this? God says, I have done this. I have brought this destruction. They will know that he is the Lord when he brings upon them the curses for their own abomination. God shows himself as the Lord through this covenant judgment. Now the question is, what about God's sheep? What about the believing Israelites? What about people like Ezekiel who's in Babylon? What about them? Will God bring covenant judgment and curses upon the whole nation indiscriminately? Will God bring covenant judgment on all of his people indiscriminately? Will he judge the righteous with the wicked? Will he destroy the righteous with the wicked? What happens to God's sheep? 
Will God sweep away the righteous with the wicked as Abraham asks in Genesis 18 verse 23? Abraham asks God, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked as he intercedes for Sodom and Gomorrah? You almost want to intercede here for Jerusalem because Jerusalem has become just like Sodom and Gomorrah. What about the righteous Lord? What about your people? What about the sheep? And so when we turn to Ezekiel 34, we find in this chapter a continuation then of God's covenant judgment pronounced against the shepherds of Israel. That's in verse 2. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourself, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You see, God is turning His attention to the leaders of His people, to the shepherds who were supposed to lead His people and feed them His word. And He's now going to pronounce judgment on them. God is particularly angry at them for their treatment of His sheep. Look at verse 6. Verse 6, God says, My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every hill. My sheep were scattered over the face of the earth with none to search or to seek for them. Notice that God takes care of his own sheep. He is angry with the shepherds because of the condition they left his sheep in. God is coming to the shepherds of Israel and he's saying, look at what you've done to my sheep. They are scattered. They've not been taken care of. So in this destruction that God brings upon Jerusalem and upon the shepherds of God's people, upon the religious leaders, those who were in Jerusalem pretending to worship God while Babylon was besieging the city, while the rest who have gone into exile are awaiting, will God destroy his city or not? God was indeed fighting for His people in exile, His true sheep who were scattered as a result of the wickedness of the leaders of Israel in Jerusalem, worshipping falsely. The sheep were scattered. The shepherds remain and God is destroying. God is destroying the shepherds for their treatment of the sheep. So what we find then is in God's judgment, His covenant judgment over the shepherds and over His people, we then find comfort as the sheep of God. His sheep find comfort in these words of judgment because God is fighting for their cause. They don't even have a cause at this point. They're weak and they're broken and they, they don't have a cause. But God is fighting for them. You see, it's not for their cause or anything. It's for them, for their condition, for their soul. He fights for them. He's against these shepherds for the soul of his sheep. The shepherds were feeding themselves. They were using the sheep for their own gain. They had thought themselves leaders of God's people who were untouchable. Doesn't this remind you of the scribes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the religious leaders in the time of Jesus? So jealous to protect their own status as religious leaders. Look at the whole world going after Him. Going after Jesus. God had already prophesied what happens to religious leaders who misuse the sheep for their own gain. Verse 2 to 4 tells the story of how they were forceful and harsh with the fragile sheep of God. They especially failed in their duty to care for the sheep. They didn't care for the weak, the weak, the sick, the injured, and the strayed and the lost. They have not strengthened. They have not healed. They have not bound up. They have not brought back, nor have they sought. Ezekiel 34 and verse 4. They abandoned their calling as shepherds. They abandon their calling as shepherds and God is angry. God is angry with the shepherds because of His love for the sheep. He is angry because of the love 
for the sheep. How dare you, how dare you shepherds treat my sheep this way. He wants his sheep cared for and protected. Instead, the shepherds cause the sheep to be scattered and to have become food for predators. That's verse 5. God reminds the shepherds that these were not any old sheep that they were supposed to shepherd. In verse 6, he says it twice. My sheep, my sheep. They are the sheep of the Lord. God calls them my sheep. My sheep were scattered. My sheep have become prey. You can almost hear the tenderness in that phrase. My sheep. Just like a man who would be angry for someone touching his wife or putting his family in danger and he would shake and tremble with anger. I'm going to kill you. And you can imagine the anger of God's against the shepherds who mistreated his bride, who mistreated his sheep. God brings in formal charges against these shepherds, verse 7 to 8. The work of a shepherd is to be concerned for the sheep. God has appointed them to care for the sheep. Now, if you know anything about sheep, you spend the most time with the most weak, the most sick sheep because it's that them that need the most attention it's the little lambs that are thrown away by the mother that you have to take the bottle to morning and evening and while they are still weak you have to open their mouth and put the bottle in their mouth and hold that bottle and growing up my dad had to say remember the way you love the sheep these these sheep will be the best ones later on in your flock you'll see you'll see we didn't understand that because it's boring every morning and every evening chasing after the lambs having to hold the thing this one doesn't want to drink and when you're impatient with them what happens you press the bottle too much and they take too much milk in goes into their lungs and they die then my dad says you haven't been gentle with the sheep how do you know well, I can see there's milk in their lungs. My dad had to teach us. And you see, this is exactly what God is saying to his shepherds. You're not treating the sheep. You're not treating the sheep as you should. David serves as an example of what a shepherd is. When Samuel anointed him as king, David then described <clears throat> the care that the sheep required when he spoke to Saul before his battle with Goliath. Remember when Saul had asked what qualifies you to go against Goliath and David then said, well, I'm a shepherd of my father's sheep and I've destroyed the bear and I've destroyed the lion, protecting them against the threats. Shepherds have a responsibility to care for the sheep with their own life. God expected his shepherds to care for the sheep with their own life. This does not mean that they are not concerned for their own safety at all. They must be reckless. You see, a shepherd must be careful, not reckless with his own life, but his life is for the sheep. He's not going to be reckless in storming that lion or that bear or thoughtless. He still has to keep in mind, I need to come out alive against that bear and against that wolf. Because the sheep still need a shepherd after this fight. They have a responsibility to protect the sheep. The shepherds also have a responsibility to provide for the sheep. Sheep eat what the shepherds provide. The shepherds lead the sheep to the pastures to feed them. And God's formal charges then against his shepherds are that they have not protected the sheep and they didn't feed the sheep. In fact, these shepherds fed themselves. You didn't feed the sheep, you fed yourselves. They used the sheep of God for their own gain. That's verse 7 to 8. The question now becomes, what will God do with these shepherds? What will God do with these shepherds? God says he will hold them liable. I am against the shepherds and I will require my sheep at their hand. These shepherds have made an enemy of God. The shepherds have made an enemy of God by the way that they treated the sheep of God. 
here is a lesson for us as well. Be careful how you treat the sheep of God. If you treat God's people as your enemy, God is your enemy. And I think more Christians, more church, people in church need to hear this. Dear Christian, it is not you against the world and against the church. Careful. Careful about being an enemy of God's people. Keep careful about being an enemy of the church. God will come up against you. I'm against the shepherds and I will cry on my sheep at their hand, God says in verse 10. He will strip them of their duties. He will take their position away from them. They abused their position of responsibility. They abused it to gain power for themselves. And God is going to take away that responsibility. The lesson here is God will strip corrupt leaders. God will strip corrupt leaders from their position when they abuse the authority of that position. The power is to discharge the responsibility. There is no power if you don't discharge the responsibility. God is going to take that power and authority away from you. Isn't that what we're seeing in our own country even? What authority do our leaders even have? They've made themselves a laughing stock of the world because they misuse their positions of responsibility. They abuse the power that comes as a result of, of their position. And now God is stripping that away from them. And what are they all trying to do at this moment? Cling to it with all of their life. Cling to that with all of their life. But it's futile because God will strip corrupt leaders from their positions when they abuse the authority of that position. The authority of a position is for the use of responsible means. When the responsibility is abandoned, the position is forfeited. When you don't take up the responsibility, the position is forfeited. You cannot have the power of that position without taking up the responsibility of that position. God will remove them for the sake of his sheep. Now what about God's sheep? We still haven't answered the question. What about the sheep? Because it sounds like God is now going at war with their shepherds and the sheep are just there hearing that God is going to be at war with them. What about them? What about their needs? Who's going to feed them? Who's going to care for them? What about the sheep? Then we see that God appoints for them a new shepherd. God will rescue his sheep from the mouth of these shepherds. Isn't it ironic that the sheep have become scattered and food for prey through the behavior of the shepherds? It sounds like these shepherds are behaving like the wolves that they're supposed to protect the sheep from. It's very ironic that they, their behavior has become wolf-like. God will rescue the sheep, the sheep from their mouth. God says, I will take and rescue them from your mouth. What is the use of a shepherd that devours the scattered sheep like wolves? God reveals himself as the shepherd of his people who will protect them from these shepherds. God has not abandoned his people like these shepherds have, but he has brought judgment on their leaders who has caused the sheep to be scattered. You see, Israel is in exile because Israel went astray and it was her shepherds who led her away from God. The leaders failed to care for the sheep. They proved to be false shepherds that led according to the heart of the people and not according to the word of God. You see, these shepherds will excuse themselves and say, we've only led as the people wanted us to lead them. People today don't want to worship God. People today want an idol. People today don't want the old hymns. They want the new hymns. People today don't want this. People today want that. Haven't you heard that before? All too often, right? People today don't want this. People today don't come to prayer meetings anymore. 
People today don't. Sick and tired of what people today don't anymore. They proved to be false shepherds that led God's people to the heart of the people and not according to God's word. The result was that God's people were scattered and that they were neglected. God then destroyed Jerusalem because the sheep were scattered from her. Jerusalem is no longer a place for the sheep. It has become a den for the wolves. Therefore God is going to destroy Jerusalem because Jerusalem is not fulfilling the purpose for which God had called Jerusalem. It's no longer Jerusalem because there's no more sheep. That's why Jerusalem fell. God's rejection and driving away of these false shepherds serves as a promise and a comfort to the sheep. The sheep are not at the mercy of the shepherds. In fact, the shepherds are at the mercy of the Lord of the sheep. In God's speech to the shepherds, the sheep hear the promise. I will search for my sheep, verse 11 to 12. I will rescue them, verse 12. I will bring them out. I will feed them. And then in verse 15, we find a glorious promise of God. He says, I myself will be their shepherd. God himself promises to be the shepherd of his people. God will not leave his sheep in the care of shepherds that have proven themselves unworthy for the task. You see, God's people on the Mount of Horeb asked that there would be a mediator between God and them. We don't want to have God so near to us. We don't want God to speak to us. Lest we die when we see him face to face. But you see here, they were afraid that they would die because of God's nearness. But can you see here in Ezekiel, God is saying, you will live because of my nearness. I myself will be your shepherd. You see God's people wanting God to be at a distance from them. We don't want God so near, but God is showing them, if you don't have me nearer and nearer and nearer to you, you cannot live. Bad things happen to you when I'm far away. He brings his people nearer to him and they will not die. Rather, they will live securely. This is the glorious movement then of this prophecy. The nearer that God comes, when He becomes their shepherd, the promises become clear. He will be near to them. They will have His goodness. Notice then, the nearness and the goodness of God in these promises. I myself will make them lie down. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. Verse 16. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. That the shepherds fail to do, God Himself will fulfill. He will be good to the sheep. It is to their benefit. It is to the benefit of God's people that he himself comes near. But just as there is judgment coming upon the shepherds of Israel, we also find that there is judgment coming upon a particular group of sheep. God promises in Ezekiel 34 and verse 16, I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Apart from protecting his own sheep, God is also going to bring judgment on the fat and the strong sheep. It's not only a judgment between the shepherds and the sheep, but also between the sheep and the sheep. The fat and the strong sheep were a threat to the weak and the injured. Those fat and strong sheep who prescribe to the shepherds, this is what we want to hear tickle our ears. We love to go this way. We love to go astray. God is now going to judge those sheep because those sheep trampled underfoot. And muddied the water that was meant for the true sheep. You see, and this is the concern for every true prophet. For every true preacher, as we said previously. There will be those who pretend to want to hear from a preacher about God. 
while they misuse and mistreat the true sheep of God, the true people of God. They think that they are deserving. They think we are part of God's flock. We are part of Israel. We are part of the church. Presuming upon the grace of God. And it is those people that are a threat and a danger to God's true sheep. But God knows the difference between a true sheep and God is turning to his flock and his flock will undergo a selection process. The fat and the sleek will be destroyed. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord, I judge between sheep and sheep. Verse 17. God is selecting the strong and the fat for destruction. God rejects the fat and the strong sheep. This is very contrary to conventional wisdom, right? Ask any shepherd, ask any farmer, and he would tell you, no, you keep the best sheep for yourself and the weak, and those were the ones you sell off. But you see, we're not talking about any old sheep. We're talking about God's sheep. God who loves the weak, the frail. God is selecting the strong and the fat for destruction. God rejects them as his sheep. This is not as the conventional wisdom sees it. We see the love and the care of God for the weak and the injured sheep. Note then that the weak and the injured sheep often don't make a sound when they are poorly treated. Sheep who are poorly treated often don't moan about it. We see too many people today moaning that they're victims. Oh, look at how badly I'm treated. Oh, true sheep that are hurt, that are injured tend not to squeal like pigs. They tend to quietly go to a corner and sit there and wait. Pay careful attention to your brothers and sisters who quietly go and withdraw themselves. You go and ask them, is there anything I can help you with? How can I pray with you? Is there anything wrong? And you approach them gently. Sheep who are weak and injured and in need don't squeal like pigs. Why is God going to destroy the fat and the strong sheep? God says that they tread down the good pastures and they muddy the clear water, verse 18. They have made use of God's blessings at the cost of the other sheep. The blessings which are meant for God's sheep, they have used for themselves at the cost of the others. We learn that God is concerned for his sheep and particularly the weak and the sick. God is taking the weak and the sick for himself and destroying the fat and the strong. God asks these fat and strong sheep. He asks them, what about my sheep? Verse 19. Must my sheep eat and drink what you have trampled and contaminated? Must my sheep eat and drink what you have trampled and contaminated? But aren't all Israel God's sheep? How can God make a distinction between his people? How can God separate the fat and the strong sheep from the weak and the lean sheep? They are sheep after all. Sheep is a sheep is a sheep. Wouldn't that mean that God's word has failed Don't you think that this is the same question in the mind of Israel when the news of Jerusalem's fall reached the exiles? Hasn't God's word failed because Jerusalem fell? Why is salvation only for a small number of Israelites and not all of Abraham's descendants? Why is there only salvation for these weak Israelites? These nobodies, they, these nothings. Did God fail in his promise toward Israel? Now, isn't this the same answer that Paul answers in Romans 9, verse 6 to 8? It is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. 
and not all are children of Abram because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. It is not those who are sheep by birth. It is not those who merely have the external blessings of their heritage. It is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. And it is in this that God is promising the selection process for the weak sheep. He is taking the weak, the injured, the frail, the forgotten, the scattered. I am here for the lost sheep of Israel, Jesus says. He says so in the gospel. When the woman comes to him and asks for help, he tells her, I have come to seek the lost sheep of Israel. Your heritage according to the flesh counts for nothing. You must not trust in the external privileges of God's people. You must not presume upon the grace of God. Presumption is not trust. It is a brazen audacity and a prideful arrogance before God. God's promises have not failed when people presume upon them because God's promises do not belong to the presumptuous. They belong to the believing. It is those of faith who are children of Abraham. John 1 verse 12, But all who did receive him who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. God will choose for himself the weak and the sick. The fat and the strong will be destroyed. Those who are self-sufficient and arrogant, those who don't need God, those who presume upon his grace will be destroyed and uprooted by God. The weak and the frail will be established as God's people. Consider also the calling of the church as Paul writes to the Corinthian Christians. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26. He tells the church, For consider your calling... Brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. Of God. So even in the church, God chooses not according to human standards, not according to conventional wisdom, but according to his own purposes. God further commits himself, verse 15, as he committed himself to be a shepherd to his people, to his sheep, he will not appoint shepherds who are unfaithful to him. He will appoint another shepherd. Verse 15, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. God will, however, appoint one shepherd. Verse 23 to 24. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them and he shall feed them and and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. We see from God's appointment then two characteristics of this shepherd. First, the shepherd will be closely identified with the Lord. If God has said, I will be their shepherd, and when God then appoints another shepherd, he's not somehow going back on his word, saying, I've changed my mind, I will be your shepherd. No, 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 someone else will be the shepherd. He's showing us the nature, the character of the shepherd himself. The shepherd... David, his servant, will be closely identified with the Lord himself. He will be God as well as man. God is already alerting us to the fact that the Messiah will be God and man. 
The second characteristic that we see then is that the shepherd will be from the royal line of David. He is so closely associated with David that, Dave, that God calls him my servant David. You see, David is long dead in the days of Ezekiel. But they're not looking back at the David that was. They're looking forward to a David to come. One from the royal line of David. And he will be the shepherd. The shepherd will be God himself. The shepherd will be Christ Jesus. This shepherd will be from the line of David. This shepherd will make God known. Verse 18 of John chapter 1. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Just as God revealed him as the Lord by covenant judgment, so God will reveal himself as the Redeemer of his people. Through the shepherd, he will reveal himself as a Redeemer. God then makes a covenant of peace, verse 25. God promises peace to his sheep under the shepherd. I will make with them a covenant of peace, says God. God will banish the wild beast from the land, and the shepherds and the sheep that behaved like beast toward the sheep of God will also be banished. Where previously the sheep were scattered, God will now drive out every threat against the sheep. And notice this, they will dwell securely, verse 25. Where will they dwell securely? In the wilderness and in the woods. How wonderful is this promise not? They will dwell securely in the wilderness and in the woods. God's people don't need Jerusalem to be secure and safe. They don't need the Jerusalem in a geographical place. They need God with them. They will dwell securely in the wilderness and in the woods. No matter where you find yourself, you are safe and secure because the shepherd is with you. You don't need to move somewhere else to be secure. You don't need to leave anywhere. You need the shepherd to come to where you are. God promises that his sheep will dwell safely in dangerous places. When God is their shepherd, even the treacherous places become a safe haven for the sheep because he is with them. God is present with them so that the wilderness and the woods become a place of safety. God further promises that he will make them he will make them and the places all around his hill a blessing. They shall be showers of blessing. God is going to make his people a blessing. It is worth noting that God will make them a blessing as it echoes the promise that God had made to Abraham. Genesis 12. Genesis 12 verse 1 to 3. God said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred. And your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. And make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The shepherds of Israel and the fat sheep quickly learn that they will be cursed for cursing the sheep of the Lord. They have cursed the sheep of the Lord, so they are cursed. God will bless his people and establish them under the appointed shepherd. And in this condition, the sheep will continue to be a blessing. God has established his people under the shepherd, under Christ, so that they may be a blessing of God. You see, the sheep of Ezekiel's day awaited the wonderful day of God's shepherd. They were looking forward to the shepherd to come. But we in the New Testament learn in the Gospels in particular that that shepherd has come. And in particularly in John chapter 10, we learn when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus owning up to this appointment in Ezekiel 34. And then when we have Christ as our shepherd, we close with the words of Romans 8 verse 31 to 39. This is then our comfort. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? 
It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn us? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth, depth nor anything else in all of creation nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promised shepherd. We thank you that we may know him as our Lord Jesus Christ. That he has come to seek the lost. That he has come to care for the weak. Thank you that he is a tender shepherd. That he is the one who will not break a bruised reed and put out a smoldering wick. But that he comes with gentleness and tenderness to the frail sheep to bind them up. To bring them into his flock. So that he may accomplish his glorious purpose through the weak of this world. O oh Lord, when we look at ourselves, when we consider our calling... Not many of us are wise according to worldly standards. Not many of us are strong. Not many of us are noble. But, O oh Lord, you have chosen the weak and the beggarly things of this world. Yes, even us. To shame the strong. To shame the wise. And so we give glory to your name. For you do all of this in us and through us and for us. Thank you for your grace. Amen. Let us now stand and sing our closing hymn, On a Hill Far Away. Let's stand together and sing On a Hill Far Away. This one will be with the accompaniment.